What happens when you combine AMD and Nvidia in the same PC? Usually it's a disaster. Crashes, blue screens, or at best, a tiny FPS boost. When I first tried this 5 months ago, I barely got a 6% increase, and for the longest time, gaming on two GPUs just wasn't worth it. Until now, because recently, people found a way to bring back Nvidia's old unsupported tech except better. But 240 FPS in every game is kind of hard to believe, so I had to try it for myself. So in this video, we're not only gonna see if it's possible, but we're gonna find out if dual GPU setups are the future of PC gaming. But before we begin this challenge, we have to have a pretty decent single GPU gaming PC to start with, and I think my main PC that I built 8 months ago is exactly what we need. But for the sake of this video, the only important thing that you need to know is that the GPU is an RX 6900 XT, and as a quick refresher, it puts out about the same performance as an RTX 3090. So while it is a powerful card, it's definitely not enough to get 240 FPS on its own, making it perfect for this video. So before we add the Nvidia GPU, let's see how my PC performs in 10 different games at max settings. This will give us a baseline to compare at the end once we put in the second GPU. Starting with Red Dead Redemption 2, a new game for the channel. It runs at 95 FPS fully maxed out in this opening scene, and looks absolutely incredible despite having no ray tracing support. But things start to get a little bit less incredible once we get to Cyberpunk 2077. Right now it's running at 73 FPS while reckless driving, which is completely fine. Not the reckless driving, I meant the FPS. But with full RT overdrive, it becomes completely unplayable, especially for a first person shooter. In an older game like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we're seeing 190 FPS on max settings with ray trace shadows, though this is the lightest part of the game to run, which is kind of ironic because it's also very dark. It gets worse again in Black Myth Wukong. I'm looking at a subpar 40 to 50 FPS just walking around despite not much happening on screen. Quite embarrassing for what was considered to be a 4K graphics card just a few years ago. In Control, we're seeing 96 FPS at ultra settings, but once you max out all five ray tracing effects, shit gets out of control. Really? Marvel Rivals, one of the most demanding competitive games, barely gets 75 FPS when nothing is going on and somehow dips below 60 FPS, yet the game doesn't really look that impressive. Now I said one of the most demanding competitive games because Fortnite exists. You probably didn't expect Fortnite to even be in this video because it's usually a CPU heavy game, but with epic settings, it makes my GPU look like some epic dog shit. I can't even hit 100 FPS in the main menu. Don't even think about building or shooting. Meanwhile, Uncharted 4 does 155 FPS very easily, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart runs at 120 FPS, and finally, Rise of the Tomb Raider is comfortably above 100 FPS. Now that we know exactly how much FPS we need to gain in every game, it's time to bring in our second GPU from the Nvidia side, the RTX 4000 ADA. It's a $1000 GPU that's essentially a hyper efficient RTX 4070 with double the VRAM, which makes it the perfect choice for this challenge. Challenge, especially compared to what I used last time, a GTX 1080 Ti. Not only was it significantly weaker and older, but the worst part is that it consumed as much power as my 6900 XT. That made it completely unsuitable since I needed to power both GPUs using just a $100 power supply. With the RTX 4000 ADA's efficiency and power, this should be a huge improvement. Or so I thought, because this is Electron Video. Anything that can go wrong, does go wrong. Physically installing the RTX 4000 was pretty easy though. I just needed to make space and it fit into the PC. But will it actually work? So I plugged in my monitor to my XT just to make sure it still runs normally, and it did. But then, the RTX 4000 wasn't recognized at all. A couple of minutes later, my screen flickered black, and there it was in Task Manager. And that's where the easy part ends, because here's where things get complicated. What isn't complicated though is reducing your ping in any competitive game, thanks to today's sponsor, Exit Lag. If you've ever lost a game because of your garbage internet, this might be the software for you. And to prove that it really does work no matter how low your ping already is, here I am in Fortnite without Exit Lag at around 12 ping. But with Exit Lag, I dropped it all the way down to a single digit, and it even works in other regions as well. That's why I never play online games without it. And if you don't believe me, you can try it yourself with a free trial using the link at the top of the description. And the best part about the free trial is that it doesn't need your credit card information. Once you're on the website, click on login, then sign up now, create your account, and confirm your email. Your free trial starts immediately. From there, click on download exit lag, follow the quick installation steps, and choose from over 2,000 games to see if it works for you. 
you. And if it does work, be sure to take advantage of their best offer of the year with six free months of exit lag. And again, be sure to at least try out the free trial with the link in the description and it might just become your new favorite app. Anyways, back to the video. Now that the easy stuff is out of the way, the next challenge is getting both GPUs to actually work together, something not even Nvidia has solved as they've completely abandoned their solution for this four years ago. How am I supposed to make both of these GPUs work together? This is where lossless scaling comes in. If that name sounds familiar, that's because LSFG has become a game changer for people with older GPUs without upscaling or frame generation. So the obvious question is, what does this have to do with running two GPUs at the same time? Well, about two months ago, lossless scaling users discovered a way to use two GPUs in a way that Nvidia and AMD never could. They're calling it the new SLI, a breakthrough that delivers a performance boost far beyond what SLI or Crossfire ever achieved. Unlike SLI or or crossfire that only work if the game supports it, this method uses the second GPU to generate more frames. You might be asking, why bother with two GPUs when Nvidia's 50 series cards can already do multi-frame generation on their own? Even this card right here has frame generation built right in. Well, believe it or not, using two GPUs actually gives you better input delay than running frame generation on the 4090 by itself. How? It's pretty simple actually. Instead of one GPU dividing its resources between running the game and generating frames, you instead have one GPU dedicated to rendering the game, while the other handles frame generation. This method only adds 11.01 milliseconds of lag, whereas DLSS3 almost doubles that. In theory, this setup should be perfect. The 6900 XT runs the game, while the RTX 4000 ADA handles the frame gen. If it works as expected, I should get a huge FPS boost without a performance hit. But there's just one problem. Problem. Getting this setup to work is easier said than done. First off, you have to plug the monitor into the GPU that's doing the frame generation, not the one rendering the game. It sounds as weird as plugging your monitor into the motherboard instead of the GPU, but hear me out. The idea is that the game runs on the XT, then those 100 or so frames get sent over to the ADA, which works its magic and outputs 240 frames to the monitor. But as you'd probably expect, plugging in the monitor to the GPU that isn't supposed to run the game led to some huge issues. Some games like Black Myth Wukong simply refused to run on the AMD GPU even after I changed the preferred GPU in the graphic settings. No matter what I did, the game would just default to whichever GPU the monitor was plugged into. Eventually, I'd have that problem sorted out, but other games had their own problems. For example, in Ratchet & Clank, our FPS dies and we're only getting 52 average FPS instead of the 120 that we're supposed to get with the 6900 XT. But if you take a quick look at the usage percentage, you'll see that we're using less than half the GPU, and that actually makes a lot of sense since we're getting less than half the expected performance. But I'll be honest, I knew exactly what was going wrong, and most importantly, I knew the solution, for once. The issue lies with with the second slot on my motherboard. It's an X1 slot, not an X16 that most modern GPUs need for maximum performance. Since only one gigabyte of data can pass through that narrow X1 bandwidth, trying to push over 100 frames through it led to that insane FPS drop. So obviously I should just get a better motherboard, but I'm broke so I'm gonna fix this problem the broke way. Instead of upgrading to a new motherboard, I decided to try something a little different. This little piece of tech is an external GPU dock that allows you to connect a GPU to just about anything that doesn't have a PCIe slot, like laptops, mini PCs, or even servers. Now you might assume that this would have a smaller bandwidth than the X1 slot on my motherboard, but since it connects to an M.2 SSD slot, it actually uses 4 lanes. But isn't that still just 4 gigabytes per second? Surprisingly, no, because my motherboard's M.2 slot is Gen 5, so we can transfer transfer up to 16 gigabytes per second, which is plenty for 1440p at 240fps. Sounds perfect, right? Well, there's just one problem. Again, take one quick look at my current setup right now and you can see the problem. Absolutely none of my SSD slots are available because this fat ass GPU covers up two of them, and this heatsink is covering up the third. But knowing this Oculink was the only way to make this setup work, I had to figure something out. Luckily, I'm only using two of my three SSD slots, so all I needed to do was move that top SSD to the bottom slot, then connect the Oculink adapter to the top slot. Separating the heatsink from the SSD was a bit scary though, and after a solid minute, I gave up. But after a quick Google search, I found out that it really isn't as sticky as it seems. So with a little bit of force, I managed to get the sticky goopy black stuff off of my SSD without snapping it in half. In the end, we still have the same storage, but now we have that top slot available for the M.2 to Oculink adapter. With everything fully set up and working, I thought I had finally done it. I've never seen a light turn on on an M.2 slot before. I think we should be good. 
I mean, green usually means good, right? And I know I said there was only one problem with this, but there's actually two. Even though the GPU doesn't need external power, the GPU dock does. And since I don't have a second 24 pin connector, I had to bring in an entirely separate power supply. So I just pulled the PSU from the 18 year old PC from my last video, and with that, everything was good to go. But when I booted up the first game, things were immediately not looking good. You can see that we are currently getting about the same FPS that we had without the second GPU, but the second we enable lossless scaling on the 4000, it drops the base frame rate all the way down to 60 FPS, which goes against the entire point of the dual GPU setup. A similar thing happened in Rise of the Tomb Raider, where our base FPS is about half of what it was with only a single GPU. But this time, when I enabled frame generation, the FPS outputted by lossless scaling are somehow even lower than the base frame rate. Somehow, we generated negative FPS. At this point, I was fairly confident that the issue had to be coming from using an NVIDIA Workstation GPU. You would think that a card with frame generation built into it would be pretty good at this, but NVIDIA graphics cards actually perform worse than their AMD counterparts in lossless scaling. For example, the RX 6400 can generate double the frames of the RTX 3060 for half the price, despite the 3060 being significantly faster at basically anything else. The RX 6400 is more comparable to something like a GTX 1650. And on top of that, I'm using a workstation card, so maybe lossless scaling just doesn't like that. Regardless, this was when I decided to switch the RTX workstation GPU with just a regular GTX 1080 Ti. The setup became increasingly complicated because I not only had to connect a second power supply to the GPU dock, but I also had to add an additional cable from my PC's power supply to connect to the 1080 Ti. With everything reconnected and a more traditional gaming GPU in place, it's finally time to see if all this effort Effort had paid off, and let me just say, this was a crazy experience. First up is Black Myth Wukong. The white FPS counter shows the base frame rate while the orange one tells us the final FPS after frame generation. If you recall from earlier, we were running about 45 FPS, and because we're running LSFG on the 1080 Ti, our base FPS doesn't take a hit like it would if we were running it on the 6900 XT. After turning on frame generation on the second GPU, we're now hitting an incredibly consistent 240 FPS. I was I wasn't able to record the frames generated by the second GPU, so I took some slow motion footage in real life and you can see that my screen does refresh 240 times per second. It's not perfect, but it feels unbelievably smooth. Control was almost just as impressive at max settings with every ray tracing setting turned on. Even from a base frame rate of around 20, lossless scaling was able to increase FPS by 11 times. And even then, the input delay wasn't bad enough to make the game totally unplayable. As you can see, I was still hitting my shots at 20 FPS. At this point, you might expect every game to perform just as well, but when the base frame rate is already pretty high, the dual GPU setup starts to fall apart. In Rise of the Tomb Raider, both the base and generated frames drop noticeably. This isn't too surprising though, because while we are technically able to send 8GB per second to the 1080 Ti, it only supports PCIe Gen 3, so it still only accepts 4GB per second. However, the other games that didn't work properly failed in a different way. Shadow of the Tomb Raider takes a massive hit to the base frame rate, but still maintains a consistent 240 FPS. Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart follows the same pattern with nearly identical numbers, and Uncharted 4 followed along, though the base frame rate still stays extremely high so I probably wouldn't have noticed without the numbers on screen. The good news is that the rest of the games didn't have these problems. Unfortunately, this is when the frame generated FPS counter became unreliable and kept breaking down, so you'll just have to trust the built-in LSFG frame counter and my slow motion footage instead. In Marvel Rivals, LSFG is absolutely worth trying. In Fortnite, it looks cool, but at the end of the day, it's still a very smooth looking 20 FPS, which isn't exactly playable. And finally, Cyberpunk and Red Dead Redemption performed exactly as expected with no issues at all. At the end of the day, running two GPUs together like this isn't perfect, but it's the closest thing we've had to SLI being actually useful in years. Some games worked exactly as we hoped, others had unexpected issues. But overall, LSFG proved that dual GPU setups still have potential. So should you buy a second GPU just for frame generation? No, but if you have a spare GPU lying around, there's no reason not to try it. And if you enjoyed this video, there's also no reason for you to not watch this video next.